Hi, my name's James and I spend uh, most of my time being nice to physics teachers for a living. That's either working at the University of Cambridge on their pre-service physics teacher education course or with the Ogden Trust supporting their work, predominantly with early career teachers, although some of their work with more experienced teachers as well. And what I want to do today is introduce you to five people that I think physics teachers should know about. I'm calling them physics education heroes. I can only scratch the surface of their work. And really the purpose of today, this little session, is to let you know that they exist, to offer a little bit of, of something of value that I think each of them can say to us as physics teachers, and then to encourage you to go on and find more about these ideas and things that spin off from them. And I'll, I'll offer some suggestions at the end as to where you can do that. And so I'll begin with this person here, Robin Miller, professor at the University of York in science education, written extensively about science education and physics education over many years. And there's an enormous body of research he's produced that you can read at a later date, should you wish. You might be familiar with his name in the context of practical work and in the teaching of energy are some of the more well-known contributions. But here I want to begin with something he said about the nature of educational research and what it can and cannot offer us. Because I think it's important we approach the world of educational research with the right framing about um, the nature of knowledge and the nature of promises that researchers can make. And I think Robin's work that I'm going to go into in a second is a nice starting point um, to frame that. And I'm drawing particularly from this book here improving subject teaching lessons from research in science education and in it he makes a particular and i think important distinction between evidence-based practice and evidence-informed practice it might sound like a really picky pedantic point about language but i think it really matters in terms of thinking about what research evidence can offer us and what we should expect from it so if we think about evidence-based practice this is a kind of if-then model you read the research, do what it says, and they will learn more. And in educational circles, particularly in physics education, there's very little of that about. It's a shame, but actually constructing this is the way you must teach this and they will learn better in any discipline is quite a difficult thing to do. So if we look to research for that kind of uh, answer, to some extent, we're going to be disappointed. But the distinction Robin then makes between evidence-based and evidence-informed practice is evidence-informed practice. We read what the researchers have said. We make some de professional decisions based in our context. Then we implement those decisions. And in fact, we then should be reflecting on the effectiveness of those. And I'll come back to those in another um, one of the readings. So that distinction, I think, is important right from the off to make. An evidence-based practice is something about outcomes. The, if we have one, we are suggesting the research will provide this outcome. Whereas evidence-informed practice is about design. And I think it's healthier and more sensible to look to research to help us in that second category, to inform the decisions that we make professionally. So for me, the distinction between those is, is clear and important and will help us kind of mediate what we expect from research. Okay, so the next person I want to talk about is Lillian McDermott. Now, Lillian McDermott um, worked predominantly in the US in working with undergraduates, but there's such an overlap between her work and what's relevant to school curriculum in the UK. I think it's, um, there's so much that she can share with us. And I want to focus on one or two points from this, which is possibly my favorite physics education uh, research paper in terms of the density of, of information that, that we can draw from that to help us be better teachers. So this is her lecture from 2001. And there are two points I'd like to draw out that I think are just worth you know, provoking us to reflect on. The first is, and, and you know, this paper was based on multiple studies, so it's not just like an opinion piece. Facility in solving standard quantitative problems is not an adequate criterion for function understanding. And what Lillian's saying here is that students who can do the numerical sums, great, it's necessary, but that does not mean if they get the correct sums that they will have a full 
understanding of all the ideas in physics. So one of the things that was involved in projects based around this kind of research strand was students were able to answer numerical questions about circuits or about forces, but when we're given conceptual questions that required descriptive answers that one couldn't go to the formula, they struggled. So it was a kind of mismatch between being able to get the sums always right and being able to explain the ideas. And so I think what that systasis teaches is, yes, absolutely, we've got to do those sums and that drill and that, all that. Yeah, no question. But if we think that's enough, then we might need to look again at what we expect our students to be able to do. So that's the first point from this lecture. The second one is about how students connect conceptual ideas, formal representations, graph charts and diagrams and the real world and how they put all those things together and how they see the connections. Because for us as experts, I can see a free body diagram, I can see a mathematical formulation of Newton's second law, and I can see a skydiver, and, and I can join those up and see the same thing. But students struggle to do that. So the second message from Lillian's lecture that I want to draw out from that point is we should be actively as physics teachers making the connections between the conceptual idea in physics the formalised representation, the graph, the chart, the equation, whatever it may be, the diagram, and then the real world example, and joining those things up as clearly as possible. Because students struggle to do it, and it's our job to help them do that. And physics is particularly kind of representational in having these diagrams and charts, so there's a lot of it that goes on in a physics lesson. So, two points from Lillian and McDermott's work which is, you know, 30, 40 years of, of, of wonderfulness, but I think worth sharing here. Next person I want to talk about is Joe Reddish. Joe Reddish, again, has been working in physics education research in the US for 30, 40 years. And so he is one of the, the, the you know, the absolute giant figures. And I want to talk about this book, because this book, probably more than any other, in my 25 plus years of thinking about physics teaching and learning has made me think deeply about thinking in physics about how students think it's where i was introduced to ideas about working memory and cognitive load you know when i read it 15 years ago this has so much in it that's worth reading and thinking about you can get hold of a copy um, second hand sometimes expensive sometimes it's not but joe has made available on on one of his departmental pages some pdfs of um, the drafts of the chapter so you can read it without necessarily having to get out of a copy if you can't. It's kind of old school, but when I when when you buy it, you know, when I bought it at the time, you get a CD-ROM in there that has um, evaluation and assessment items, both for conceptual understanding and attitudes. And what I like about that, if we go back to the thing from, from Robin Miller's point earlier about evidence-informed practice, is that here and elsewhere, and I'll show you where to get them, there are tools for us to evaluate our practice. Having a good idea is not enough. Implementing it's not enough. We have to have a tool for analysis. So this book's an absolute stone-cold classic, in my view, about thinking about students thinking in physics. So a really powerful one. Next person, Paul Hewitt. Paul Hewitt wrote what is my pretty much favorite physics textbook of all time. It's called Conceptual Physics. Uh, different versions come out, but as we know, a lot of physics hasn't changed much since 1915, so don't worry if you get an old copy. But what I want to draw out from Paul Hewitt's work here is he is a brilliant explainer. <laughs> One of the things for us as physics teachers is we have difficult ideas and having a well rehearsed, well thought through explanation is part of our armory. People get into a kind of tears and argument about scripted lessons or not. I don't care about any of that. But what I do think is when it comes to hard ideas in physics, we should have a kind of script or a rehearsed explanation because it's tricky stuff. We need to explain in the right order. And that's something that experienced physics teachers accumulate over time. And if you're early in your career, I would encourage you to write down your explanation for a hard idea, because that is part of the power of what we have as teachers. And we don't often get to hear other people explaining. So when you buy the conceptual physics book, you get to read Paul explaining difficult ideas in physics. 
And if you want to listen to him, that's fine. Hewitt Druitt, 149 YouTube videos where he goes through physics ideas and explains them and teaches them. I'm not saying you necessarily should copy all of them. I'm not sure, even though he's a kind of hero of mine, that I would agree with all of his explanations. But what a powerful resource with all of these videos to hear a kind of masterclass physics teacher explain whether it's, you know, forces and resolution or banking curb motion, whatever it may be. We've got a resource here in the book and in Paul's work on those videos to listen to someone else explaining physics, which is just, you know, why would you not want to listen to other people explaining physics so that we can all become better? And in thinking about getting better as a physics teacher, I want to focus on a piece of work that this researcher, Eugenia Ekina, was involved with. Eugenia taught on the pre-service physics teacher education course at Rutgers in the US for many years, but more broadly has produced a significant and valuable body of research about what we know about physics teaching and learning and particularly about physics teachers. So I certainly would encourage you to check out other things she's written because it's well worth a look. But here I want to focus on her work focusing on the kind of attributes, habits and behaviours of physics teachers that we might want to nurture in others or indeed in ourselves. So she wrote this with Bohr and Stomatis together about, they've written a number of papers, this one's freely available, and they talk about habit development. And they talk about the idea of becoming a good physics teacher and improving as a physics teacher as a process of developing habitual behaviors. I haven't got the time to go into all the ways you can do that, but I think it's a really helpful way of framing, how do I become a better physics teacher? And their three habits are habits of maintenance and improvement. What are we doing as physics teachers to improve and develop our practice? Well, one thing you're doing is watching this now as part of Chat Physics. That is the community in which this happens. So the first question I would say when we're thinking about how do we become a better physics teacher is what are we doing to seek out advice, wisdom and thought to improve our practice, because that should be part and it should be habituate. The second habit that um, Eugenia and Bohr and Stomatis refer to is habits of mind, thinking like a physicist. The other morning, I'm grinding my coffee beans and I think, oh, hold on a minute. That's me, what mechanical energy transfer, la di da, thermal increase, get my infrared thermometer out, measure the temperature of my beans, measure the temperature of my coffee grains. Oh, hold on, the temperature's gone up because there's been a mechanical transfer involved. So that's thinking like a physicist, turning everything into a physics lesson. That comes with practice, but that is one of the ways, the habits of mind of physics teachers that um, we would want to encourage. And the third habit that they talk about is habits of practice, the things that we do in the classroom. Whether it's about how we ask questions, I mean, to some extent, you could argue some of the things I referred back to, particularly the stuff from the Elite McDermott, if you build those into your classroom practice, then that would be a kind of habitual behaviour that you get used to always connecting between the real and the formalised and the conceptual and the, those things. So I offer that, it's a bit more theoretical, but it's a way in which we can think about how do we get better as physics teachers. What are our improvement habits? How are we trying to get better? How are we thinking like a physicist? And what are we embedding in our, in our lessons on a regular basis? So there we are, as I said, only scratch the surface, but five people in physics education uh, that I think have something to offer and way more than what I've just highlighted there, but there they are. Robin Miller, Lily McDermott, Paul Hewitt, Joe Reddish and Eugenia Aquina. They are people who I feel everyone in physics education should know about and should listen to. You don't have to agree with everything, but you should listen to them. Want to know some more? Well, I certainly hope you do. This is just the beginning of it. Where do you go? Fizport is the website for the American Association of Physics Teachers that becomes the gateway to a lot of research work and practitioner guide worth registering, worth having a rummage. Some of those things that were in the CD-ROM in the back of Joe Redish's book, the assessment tools, they are available as downloads from there under the assessment tab, the fourth on the top. 
You can also use that to get into PER Central Compadre, which links you into a lot of physics education research papers if you want to dig deeper into what's going on. You want an easier read? That's fine. Classroom Physics, the IOP's magazine, Richard Brock and myself, we write a column in every issue where we take a particular piece of physics education research and we try and offer us as best you can in 450 words a digest. That's available to affiliated schools, but it's downloadable on the IOP's website. This document is available. There'll be a link somewhere. You can email me where I've taken my 10 favourite physics education papers, some of the stuff we've mentioned, some other ones, and I've offered a summary of why you should read that book or that paper and what I think are the most important messages from it. So there's a really good starting point, I would suggest, if you're interested in reading some more researchy work. And uh, I guess I've got to do some kind of shameless plug. This is the latest edition of the ASE's Teaching Secondary Physics Guide. And you'll see there's a number of, um, you know, a collection of authors who've across the physics education um, spectrum of, of well regarded and experienced people. And the point I make here is this is an example of back to Robin's point about evidence informed practice. We in writing these chapters have digested ideas from the research and we've made some of the decisions for you in terms of suggesting what could be included. Um, you know, we read the paper so you don't have to. We want you to go back and read those things, but equally teachers are busy. So this guides here. So there we go. The five heroes that I think are worth bearing in mind. I've got more, come back another time for that. But I think all of those five people you should know about uh, and hopefully they've got some messages for you as a teacher. Cheerio.